welcome to Legally Speaking. My name is Paul Henderson, and today you're in for a rare treat. We are sitting down with legal luminary Eva Patterson. Now, Eva has been an advocate of civil rights for many, many years, and she is currently at the head of Equal Justice Society, where she has served since 2003. Prior to that, she served the majority of her career in leadership positions with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. She's been involved in numerous landmark cases and legislation here in California related to Prop 209 and Prop 187, both legislations involving civil rights related to affirmative action and immigration rights. In the 1970s, Eva was dubbed a peaceful warrior when, as a student leader, she actually participated in an on-air debate with sitting Vice President Spiro Agnew Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I introduce you to our conversation with noted civil rights advocate, Eva Patterson. Eva. Paul. So you've served on a number of civil rights organizations. I have. Like the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, mm -hmm. and presently you're the president and founder of the Equal Justice Society. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about why you started the organization? In the late 1980s, there was a series of very horrible Supreme Court rulings. I remember driving into work across the Bay Bridge into San Francisco every day, and there'd be a horrible Supreme Court ruling, just chipping away at civil rights gains. And I'd start weeping and thinking, well, time to quit law and start my jazz club in San Francisco. Um, I also noticed that the um, progressive community was very splintered. We'd really work at cross purposes to get, uh, and wouldn't work together. And I also noticed that the right wing was being very effective on messaging. They were able to get people to act against their interests by calling the estate tax the death tax. Right. And they were very good at framing issues in a way that made people act against their interests. So I thought, Maybe it's time to start a new organization that looks at law, messaging, looks at young people in a different way. I also was very taken by Charles Hamilton Houston, um, Thurgood Marshall, and others who knocked out Plessy versus Ferguson right. with a multi-decade strategy of using social science and litigation to change the law. There were some laws that I wanted to change, and so I wanted to model my organization after what Charles Hamilton Houston did. As a matter of fact, we called it the Thurgood Marshall uh, Society at first. So it was time for a change. I had been at the Lawyers Committee for 26 years. Right. At that point, it was half my life. Um, and I wanted to do something different. So um, I had lunch with one of my best friends and was complaining. She said, well, I think you need to move on. So it was that whole kind of constellation of factors that um, promoted, that prompted me to start the Equal Justice Society. Now that was in 2003. Actually, 2000, but, 2000, it was, it okay. was, but we actually started, um, I left the Lawyers Committee formally in 2003. Got it. And then has your opinion about your objectives with your present organization changed over the years? Well, I'm a litigator, and I wanted mm -hmm. to get into court right away to make some changes in the law, but it took us a while to find the perfect case. We finally just found the perfect case two months ago, you know, 14 years after we started. One of the things that happened is we had a conference at Stanford, and Michelle Alexander spoke yes. before she had written The New, the Jim, New Crow, Jim Crow, which right. is such a brilliant, important piece of work. We, we decided that we wanted to combine three elements of, of reality. We wanted lawyers, we wanted media, and we wanted social science. So Michelle presented a concept called implicit bias, which talks about the fact that there are many things in our unconscious that get us to do certain things. Um, I think uh, Officer Darren Wilson probably is not an overt racist. And you're referencing uh, the incident in Ferguson. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, where he shot and killed Michael Brown. Yes. He described Mike Brown as a demon. I don't think he would have described a large white man as a demon. I think we have many, and, so, and social science research has shown us, that we have many unconscious views about particularly black men. We associate black men with criminality and aggression, whether they're doing something wrong or not. And so she talked about implicit bias. It got a very positive response from the audience, and we've been talking about implicit bias for 11 years since. And so I didn't think we'd be doing a lot of um, education, talking to judges about implicit bias, right. police officers, 
uh, teachers and the like. So we actually have been working on amicus briefs and litigation, but we've also tried to talk about race in a way that's non-threatening. And by talking about implicit or unconscious bias, you can have conversations with people where you're not calling them a racist. You're just saying, look, you might have, um, well, let me give you an example. There's a study that was done where they had resumes and they sent out uh, resumes blindly. They had the same resume. One resume said Brandon at the top. The other said Jamal. The one that had Brandon, which is t typically associated with white people, got more callbacks. The resumes with Jamal at the top got fewer callbacks. I'm sure if you ask those people if they're prejudiced against black people, they'd say no. But something unconsciously went on in their minds about um, who they associate Jamal with, what they think Jamal would be like as an employee. So we've been talking about that in terms of um, who gets a death penalty, who gets employed, um, medical situations. Mm -hmm. If you think about the man in um, Dallas, the guy who, right. who was- um, With came, Ebola? Exactly, who right. came with Ebola. He just sat in the um, emergency room for hours and nothing happened to him and he was sent home. There is data that shows that black people will get fewer uh, uh, interventions, less medication and the like. So even though we were de going down this path towards litigation, we've been able to engage people in a discussion about race by talking about implicit bias. In fact, our tagline is transforming the nation's consciousness on race through law, social science, and the arts. So it's not exact, I thought we'd be in court yeah. all the time and we're, we're in court with amicus briefs but we're doing a lot of public education on race as well. I think that's really important. I love the conversation about the implicit bias mm -hmm. and the approach. Mm -hmm. Is that really something that is easy to prove though in court through litigation? I mean, it's such an intangible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and subjective issue. Is that difficult to use proactively with an agenda like yours? The courts are split. The Supreme Court in the Walmart case, the Dukes case, particularly Scalia, kind of poo-pooed the notion of implicit bias. But other courts have been starting to take it up seriously. The Washington State Supreme Court talked about implicit bias in a case involving the exclusion of a black man from a jury. And as a matter of fact, they cited one of the law review articles that we wrote. I, actually, I cry a lot. I cried when I saw our article cited in a footnote. So courts are beginning to take it seriously. I I was fortunate enough to speak before the Ninth Circuit this summer, and Justice Kennedy happened to be in the room, which made me very nervous, but I got to talk to the Ninth Circuit judges about implicit bias and how that should be taken into account in how they look at cases. There's a particular legal doctrine uh, under the 14th Amendment which says, in order to prove that the 14th Amendment's protections against discrimination have Intent. been violated, yes. you must prove that it was intentional. Right. Most people don't think they're um, bias. I was reading something about the Ku Klux Klan. There's a new chapter in one of the western states and apparently they're letting black people join. So the Ku Klux Klan doesn't even think it's racist. Right. And I, But on a more serious level, I think we've come to a place in American society where people do not want to be racist. I think we've gotten to that place. There's a there's a analysis called racism without racist. If you look at the indicia of of anything, uh, infant mortality rates, who gets incarcerated, health outcomes, you'll see that black and brown people typically are in a worse state than whites and Asian Americans. And so, by talking about um, implicit bias and racism in this way, I think we're slowly being able to get the courts to listen. It's going to take a while, but it took Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston a while to get the courts to say that segregation uh, has a negative impact on white and black people. It took them years to get to that point. So by having implicit bias put in amicus briefs, talking to judges, having courts slowly accept it, we're slowly chipping away at the intent doctrine and we like to replace it with the disparate impact standard, right. which just looks at racial disparities without having to prove that there was racial animus behind it. And that is a specific attack on the intent issue? Exactly. And you're tying the bias specifically to disproportionality. Exactly. What we're saying is, well, I'll give you an example. We have sued the Bakersfield High School School District. Mm -hmm. If you're a black student, your chance of getting disciplined or suspended or expelled is 500% higher than if you're white. Mm 
Wow. If you're Latino, it's about 400% higher than if you're white. Yet, I'm sure if you ask those teachers and administrators, are you expelling these kids because they're black and Latino, they'd say no. And because we could not necessarily prove that they intentionally did it, or that the suspensions or expulsions were motivated by racial animus, we might not be able to win under the 14th Amendment. The way we see the 14th Amendment is that if you just show that black and Latino kids are disproportionately suspended as opposed to white kids, that says that gets your result that the Equal Protection Clause has been violated. We think the intent standard puts uh, an unnecessary hurdle between injustice and justice. We are one of the few countries in the world that has the intent standard. Most. Um, other governments and, and judiciaries have the disparate impact standard. But, but isn't that still the law from the 1976 Supreme Court ruling? It that is. Was Washington, Washington v. Davis. versus Davis right. as affirmed in um, McCleskey versus Kemp where right. we showed that if you kill a white person you're much more likely to get the death penalty. Right. So we're trying to overturn Washington versus Davis wow. and I McCleskey see. versus Kemp in the same way that uh, Thurgood Marshall and his banned um, overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. The law seems to indicate that if there's a change in the science, you're able to then change the law. And we're saying that in 1976, there were many more instances of overt racism than there are now, that people mistakenly say we're post-racial. We have a black president. Right. You know, why are you complaining? Nothing's wrong. Um, but we know if you look at, this, at the statistics, there are, are major problems. We're able to actually um, do functional MRIs on people's brains, and we have sh uh, social scientists have shown that the same part of your brain that lights up when you see a spider or a snake is the part of your brain that lights up when you see a black person. Dr. Um, Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford has done studies that show that when you see a black person's face, it evokes the face of an ape. And when you think about Darren Wilson, Ferguson, Michael Brown, he's a demon, there are all these unconscious associations between our faces and people who aren't human. In fact, I think in Los Angeles they had a code called NHI involving black and Latino suspects right. and that no human involved, and that was from the police. That's correct. So we're not necessarily seen as full humans. And, and, and even though people may consciously say, oh, no, 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 I don't see you as a, an ape, there are unconscious reactions that people have that result in very, in, we see, we're seeing this epidemic of black and brown men being shot to death by police or um, citizens. And the thing that's- At a rate that's exponentially higher than the rest of society. And I was thinking about that white man, and I have nothing against white people, some of my best friends right. are white people, mm -hmm. so people out there <laughs> watching don't trip. Right. But the white man who shot all those um, uh, policemen and uh, state, patrol, state patrol people in Pennsylvania, yes. he shot oh, yeah. and killed I people. That case. He went to jail, he's alive. Yeah. Um, the guy who um, did all the horrible things in the Aurora um, movie theater, Mm -hmm. He went to he that went came to in prison. With the gun, right. Exactly. He went to jail alive. Yet Michael Brown is dead. And I think many people in society, not just police officers, but many of us, just have a really negative view of black people and dark skin. So that's why the implicit bias concept is important and it's something that we are going to present to the court. It was exciting to have Justice Kennedy in the audience um, when this was discussed. We had black judges who came up afterwards and said, thank you so much for putting this out there. It's a whole different way of looking at things. Um, are you still at a stage where you're introducing the concept of implicit bias or are you a little further along in terms of using it as a tool? We've introduced it in scholarly works. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of law review articles that we've put out. In fact, one's coming out in a Harvard journal in December mm -hmm. about implicit bias in the criminal justice system. So it's out there. Uh, and we just filed this suit in Bakersfield where we're alleging and talking about implicit bias. We're in the middle of settling a case in uh, Contra Costa County where we're saying that the disproportionate suspensions and expulsions of black kids in special ed has a lot to do with implicit bias. A friend of mine was at a conference two weeks ago in D.C. dealing with lawyers who deal with implicit bias and special ed. And they, just, they took a poll in terms of what was the main cause for the disproportionate suspension mm -hmm. of black kids in special ed. The number one cause was implicit bias. And we had nothing to do with this. So it's, a, it's an idea 
whose time is coming. But we are now, it's, it was so exciting to file this case in Bakersfield because we're going to be explicitly talking about implicit bias. Now, now you keep referencing we. Are you talking just about Equal Justice Society? Are you referencing a broader coalition? Are there other groups and organizations that you work with, a partner with, uh, with this agenda? Yes. Um, in the case involving special ed, we're dealing with DREDF, the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. They mainly deal with the special ed piece of it and brought us in to deal explicitly with the implicit bias piece. Uh, their, their managing attorney, Arlene Mayerson, has heard us talk about implicit bias for years, and she wanted to bring that in to the litigation. And so there's not just implicit bias against black people and Latinos, there's implicit bias about disabled people. Um, I now walk with a cane because of my arthritis and I see how differently people treat me because I'm a little bit disabled. In the Bakersfield case, we're co-counsel with CRLA, California Rural Legal Assistance, mm -hmm. MALDEF, Mexican American Legal yes. Defense Fund, and Greater Bakersfield Legal Aid. And we think, and we can't announce it yet, but one of the biggest firms in the Silicon Valley is coming in as co-counsel counsel with us. And they've been on cases with us up to the Supreme Court litigating implicit bias. So there's the, it, it's an idea whose time has come. It makes a lot of sense. It's, a, it's an easier way of talking about race right. than talking about overt, overt racism. I, I think that's so interesting specifically about all of the groups that you're working mm -hmm. collectively mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and looking in your past and all of your successes. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that you've done a very good job of building broad coalitions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of working with other groups mm -hmm. to develop an agenda mm -hmm. and focus on specific mm -hmm. goals. Mm -hmm. Has that always been something that you've known that you needed to do or were you forced into a position where you needed to bring more people to the table to work with you? You know, that's an interesting question, Paul. Um, I think it has, has a lot to do with Bay Area politics. Uh, in 1983, the Reagan administration was going to sue the San Francisco Fire Department and settle the right. case on the same day. It was one of those cases called, we didn't do anything wrong and we won't do it again. We got the settlement leaked by uh, Reverend Gloyd when he was in town. Mm -hmm. He was the head of the- I remember him. Re Re Reverend Gloyd? Mm -hmm. He was the head of the Civil Service Commission. He said, this right. is coming. You don't want this to happen. So at the time, we were just representing black fire firefighters. I was also, I think at that time, on the board of the Equal, right, of Equal Rights Advocates. And at the time, there were no women on the, in the fire department. They weren't even allowed to apply till 1978. So there's a rumor out that the black firefighters were going to block the women from coming in. I knew the black firefighters. I talked to them. They said, that's ridiculous. So the, the black firefighters and the women firefighters coalesced. Now, we knew that in the Bay Area, if we did a class action case that excluded Asian Americans and Maldef and mm -hmm. um, Latinos, our name would be mud. We also knew on a kind of an idealistic level that we wanted to desegregate the entire fire department. So it was altruism, idealism, and pragmatics. All together. Now you've been a benefit. Absolutely. You've benefited from Absolutely. affirmative action as have I. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to hear your thoughts about affirmative action early on as you were benefiting from it. Uh, do you think that they helped shape your experiences or your approach to civil rights now? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was, like most of us, a nerd in high school, you know, National Honor Society got really good grades. I went to desegregated schools because I'm a military brat. So I always did very well. When I got to college, I was in school with everybody who had done very well, and I was no longer at the top of the heap. And you went to Northwestern. I went to Northwestern right. University, mm -hmm. uh-huh. And I majored in taking over buildings and partying. Um, I guess I shouldn't <laughs> say that, but people can recover from that, those dual majors. And so my grades weren't great. The day before the um, SA, LSATs, the, the test that you take to get into law school, I studied at the library for an hour with my then boyfriend, and then we went to watch the Battle of Algiers. And I can assure you the Battle of Algiers was not on the LSAT. I had always done well on tests. I didn't think it was a big deal. I did okay, but I wasn't at the top. So I applied to um, Berkeley. I applied to Yale first. Mm -hmm. um, and I had 19 units of incomplete on my record. They were not impressed. I had been president of the student body. I had debated Vice President Agnew. I thought I was so bad. Of course Yale will want me. They went, 
girl, we looked at those 19 <laughs> units of incomplete. We don't think you're getting in here. Now, here's my sad story about this. That was the same class Clarence Thomas got into. And I you am convinced, kidding. had I gotten there, we could have hung out together. <laughs> I would have, you know, got him on the right path. So I feel responsible for his wayward path. So I worked for the ACLU in Northern California for a year, and then I applied to Berkeley Law School. And this should tell you something about the times. I was called by a woman named Sister Marie 2X. There's nobody called Sister Marie 2X at Bolt and told me that I got in. And I got in on affirmative action. It was called special admissions. Mm -hmm. In that class, there were 30 black students, 30 black students in my class. The year after affirmative action was eliminated, there was one black student in Correct. that class. I met that one student. Yes, and so there would have been no black students in that class. Now, other people I went to school with at Bolt at that time, People like, you know, um, John Burris. Yes. Fabulous lawyer. But he would not have gotten in had there not been race consciousness. So I think affirmative action really helped me. I wouldn't be sitting here today. I wouldn't have. Um, and nor would I. Exactly. Nor I would wouldn't I. have had colleagues who are federal judges. I wouldn't have been invited to speak to the Ninth Circuit. There are people there I knew who knew me, who could vouch for me. It opened doors. But as someone once said, they Affirmative action opens the door, but you have to walk through on your own. I took the bar. I passed the first time. I've been litigating for, oh, my God, almost 40 years. Um, and I think affirmative action is a marvelous uh, tool. People forget that affirmative action is not just about education. It's also about employment and about contracting. I think that the kind of buried part of the affirmative action fight is the contracting piece. Um, we just finished a study that was commissioned by the Cerdna Foundation, and we found that literally billions of dollars that should have gone to people of color-owned businesses mm -hmm. and women-owned businesses did not go to us because of Proposition 209, the anti-affirmative action initiative that was passed in 1996. Without affirmative action, something like 3% of government contracts go to women and people of color. With affirmative action, it's up 10 25 percent and that's a lot of money we as people of color and women pay taxes we're talking about state contracts we're talking there were, there were people we knew in, in San Francisco a couple of guys who lived in the housing projects when affirmative action was in place and when San Francisco had to look um, and make sure that people of color got contracts these two guys bought some trucks and started to get contracts from the city, got out of the housing projects. We had black men who were in the housing projects and got jobs through affirmative action at the fire department and were able to get themselves out of poverty because you don't have to have um, an advanced degree right. to be a firefighter. We did some work for the city and county of San Francisco about affirmative action and there was a very interesting Chinese American woman who owned a concrete company in San Francisco. I went, who is this sister? And she said something very interesting. She said because there were no, um, there was no more affirmative action in the award of contracts in San Francisco, she had to cut back on her business. And she had been hiring right. Chinese American people. We know that people of color tend to hire more people of color. Women hire women. So it, it's it's not a trickle down. It's a ripple effect. And so have you vigorously. always felt this way? I mean, it, when you were benefiting from affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Did you have such clarity about its importance, obviously, in your own life, but is it what shaped where you are now and the work that you do? He, I don't know if this is exactly responsive, but um, I remember when I was representing the black firefighters and they were treated so badly mm -hmm. because they got into the positions because of a court mandate. Um, my experience at Bolt and having people, the law school at the University of California, Berkeley, my experience of having people treat me like I was stupid because I was affirmative action admit yes. helped me understand my clients much more. I had always been an honor student, had been a leader, and I don't say that, oh, I'm so fabulous, but it was quite a shock to be in an environment where people thought I was stupid. I was. It took me quite a f bit of time to get over that. But you've had some real big goals that you had accomplished mm -hmm. before even coming to mm -hmm. law school. I mm -hmm. think you referenced it earlier. You mm -hmm. had a national debate with mm -hmm. the vice president. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I'm curious as to when you focused to determine what your mission was going to be with your career. When did you decide that this is what I want to do is focus on civil rights, that 
I want to help disenfranchised communities. How did that evolve? I think there are many pieces to that. Um, I was grown, I, I was raised as a Christian and went to Sunday school and there was always a sense of morality. And I don't want to say, oh, I'm the most moral, fabulous person, but just a sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one part of it. I came of age politically in the 60s. I was in college right. from 67 to 71, and there were all kinds of things going on. Um, I came in as a Negro and left as a black person. Um, I had grown up around mainly white people, and so it was quite interesting for me to be around a lot of black folks who were into black power, black studies, black dorm, and it, it revolutionized my thinking. I entered college supporting the war in Vietnam because my father had just gotten back from serving there for a year. Yeah. And I actually said things like, well, we have to support the war because the president says we have to support it and what the president says is right. Ay, ay, ay. I can't believe I ever said that. And <laughs> argued with the people from McCarthy. And meant it. I d oh, oh, argued vociferously in the line to get dinner. Um, also, I was exposed to the feminist movement. So I was... In a, in a cauldron, if you will, in an environment where people were looking at the wrongs of the world and trying to figure out how to change them. And there was a law reform unit that I got to work in my last year of law school. And they were, um, if I could say this on TV, they were kicking ass and taking names. I don't think I can say that. <laughs> but they were brilliant. And it was when legal aid could do class action lawsuits. Right. There were no, no restraints on them. And I think that's where I really got the bug. Because when I was um, in a, a regular office, I did you know, uh, unlawful detainers, uh, people being uh, done by their creditors, yes. uh, that kind of thing. And so I like doing that, but I really like the notion of law reform. So it was a com, and then, and then I, when I graduated from law school, I was a legal services attorney at um, 88th and East 14th Street in East Oakland. And I had women, mainly black clients, I'm all black clients. And um, when black women came in and kept saying they were being beaten by the men they were involved with, and the police either wouldn't come, if they came, they would take the boyfriend or the husband's side, or they tell the boyfriend to take a walk around the block and they would leave. And so I thought, this is an equal protection case. And so we brought, that was the first impact case I ever brought. So it was, it was, it was, um, just many things kind of coming together. Um, well, talk, tell me about the results of that. Oh, what oh. happened with that case? It was very interesting. It was called Scott versus Hart. And my boss said, oh, that case, nothing's going to come with that case. And actually stopped me as I was walking out the door to file it because my lead plaintiff was my secretary. He said, they're going to take your deposition and they're going to find out that she's your secretary. You can't do that. So we had to start all over. There was a very bad case called Rizzo versus Good out of the U.S. Supreme Court, Philadelphia case, Mayor Frank Rizzo. It made it very difficult to prove a pattern and practice case against... Some behavior. Exactly, right. exactly. We also found that it wasn't just black women. It was that no women were being held right. by the police and everybody was beating up everybody. So we went into court. It was, I think, four women and a black man, which was very unusual in 1976. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but in federal court, you often have to sit in the uh, jury box while mm -hmm. you're waiting to be called. And bailiffs will come up and go, you can't sit there. Defendants can't sit there. And we went, excuse me, I'm a lawyer. That crazy stuff. I just heard Brian Stevenson, who's a saint, said that just happened to him this year. I've had that experience. My very first time appearing in court. It, it's just. Happened. As a lawyer. It just takes your breath away. Takes your breath away. I thought it was because it was 76. I guess the beat goes on. So I think the judge was kind of startled by us walking into federal court. And mainly it was like, you know, white guys, corporate lawyers, and then us. We, we had been trained very well, and he later told us that he was very impressed by our arguments, by our briefs, and, and the like. We were on our job. We were on our job. He was, we walked into chambers, and he had Rizzo v. v. Good open on his coffee table. We went, well, we're, we're dead. We're the dead. case, yes. The case, the case. We later found out that he had a woman law clerk who said, don't dismiss the case, give them a chance. And, because, and so this is something for anybody watching this. Funny things happen, funny things. In funny ways. Exactly, exactly. You don't know what's going to make things go your way. So because he didn't dismiss the case and because we had a reasonable uh, city attorney on the other side, we sat down and started negotiating a settlement. And so we negotiated a rather amazing settlement, which had us, we retrained 
every police officer in the Oakland Police Department. Now, now you talked about expanding from that and mm -hmm. getting involved in state politics, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. specifically Lord. with legislation. Mm -hmm. Now, I know from your history that you've both been supportive of legislation mm -hmm. and you've been against mm -hmm, proposed mm -hmm, legislation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, specifically mm -hmm. when they come to the polls. Exactly. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about some of your work. Uh, based on my review, it seems as though you've had some mixed results. Uh, a horrible with, disaster and a great victory. Right, mm -hmm. with uh, Prop 209 mm -hmm. uh, and then with uh, Proposition 54. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about expanding the focus at a statewide level for uh, those well, issues. Well, it's very interesting, Paul, because a lot of law is now made at the ballot box. And I don't think, at least when I was in law school, they didn't teach us about that. They didn't teach us right. about how to run a political campaign. And just so we're clear, I just want to reference mm -hmm. that both Prop 209 and 54 deal with race and equity exactly. in case people aren't familiar exactly. with what they did and exactly. what happened. There's an interesting story behind Proposition 209. In 1993, Patrick Buchanan, right wing conservative columnist, wrote a column saying that the only way that the Republicans could win the White House in 1996 was to get the crown jewel, and that is the 56 at that point in time, electoral votes of California. And that the Republicans needed to put something on the ballot which would get out which was what was then called the angry white men. I think they'd be called mm. the Tea Party mm -hmm. now. But they needed an issue. So the issue that he put forward was affirmative action. At the time, affirmative action was way down on the list of concerns of people in 1996. But once again, right-wing people are always able to play the race card as and, and use people of color. Exactly. Scaring white people and Asian Americans sometimes about Latinos and African Americans. We also got word that there was something called the Committee of Scholars. And they had heard that in California, there was going to be an affirmative action plan that mandated having the same percent of people of color on the faculty as were in the student body. So the white men, and this was out of Princeton, they thought, oh my God, we're going to lose our jobs. Would have put them out jobs. of jobs, right. Exactly. We also heard at the same time that there was a consent decree with the Department of Forestry, which mandated having more women come in. And some of the men there were upset. So you had this perfect storm. The Republicans looking for an issue, um, the right-wing professors on the East Coast being concerned, white male forest fighters thinking they were going to lose their jobs. You also had Governor Pete Wilson, who wanted to run for president. His friend was Ward Connerly. Ward Connolly was a man who had benefited from affirmative action uh, because he had, he had contracts uh, that were given to him as a black man and his and wife. And they rejected all of that. Yes, yes. So um, Governor Wilson, strangely enough, when he was the mayor of San Diego, had had the uh, San Diego Convention Center built with goals and timetables for, men, for people of color and women. So he full, wholeheartedly embraced affirmative action. Now, the year before, a couple of years before, he had put Proposition 187 on the ballot to try that. to gin up anti-Latino, anti-immigrant sentiment, and that helped him a lot. So you can never go wrong in American society making black people and Latinos scapegoats. And Prop 187 focused on immigration. That's exactly right. It was going to deny services to Correct. undocumented people. That in initiative was sector, blocked right. in the courts. So you had a uh, Proposition 209, which would have eliminated affirmative action, would have eliminated the use of race in considering who gets into universities and colleges, public, in public education, public employment, and in the award of public contracts. Um, and so they, the people who were behind Proposition 209 were brilliant. They field tested, I've been told, 27 different versions of the initiative. They basically settled on language which tracked the language of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. When I went in to vote, and I had been working on this for three years, I read it and I went, that sounds good, even though I knew it was What was gonna, behind the initiative. Exactly, right. but it was brilliantly um, worded. So we, we put a campaign together. We didn't know what we were doing. The biggest mistake we made was by thinking that just by saying loud enough, affirmative action is wonderful. If you're against it, you're a racist dog. That's ridiculous because in hindsight, that would appeal to the people already on your side. But mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is get to the persuadables, the people in the middle. And so what we did, and this was really horrible, our, we 
got a lot of money together and we had one ad. And the basic, the ad basically said, if you're against affirmative action, you're in league with the Ku Klux Klan. Now, who's that going to move? Nobody. And so now, when you look at the state of civil rights, mm -hmm. Uh, not just in California, mm -hmm. but in the rest of the nation. And this is probably something that you've addressed in the past or contemplated in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, people say that we're in a post-racial society. We have big luminaries of success that are measurable, like Oprah and Obama. Speak to me about your thoughts and where we are as a nation. Are we in a post-racial society, and what does that mean in terms of addressing civil rights? We are not post-racial. We have a black president. Yes, we do. Um, there's a professor named Andrew Hacker who taught at, I think, City College in New York. Mm -hmm. And he, several years ago, asked his class, mainly white people, if you were to be turned black at midnight, how much money would you need to feel like you were okay? Now, if we were post-racial, people would go, I wouldn't need any money. My life would not be any different. They were like, one million, two million. So people know that there is a difference in your life possibilities and the like if you have dark skin. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown. I don't think if those young men had been white, they would be dead. I do not think they would be dead doing exactly the same, situ same activities. If you, I read recently that Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times said that the wealth gap between blacks and whites in America is larger than that gap during the height of apartheid. I feel like I have a pretty good life. You know, I feel like, you know, I was in Bakersfield and I didn't have the lights on in my rental car and I was stopped yeah. by a police officer. I was really nervous. And I said, oh, officer, here's my Hertz rental, blah, blah, blah. And he said, let me see your driver's license. And I showed it to him. He said, well, I've got to take it back and make sure you're really authorized to be driving. And I wanted to curse him out. Like, what are you talking about? But I didn't. I was angry, but I didn't feel like a victim. I felt um, like I was mistreated because mm -hmm. I was black. But then I was pulling my car up to the hotel, and the two guys who were there to take my bags and said, oh, he treated you nicely. They're much nastier to us, and they are white people. So, But I, I, <laughs> I don't feel like a victim. I feel like um, I have a law degree. I can notice a deposition and make people come to my office and answer questions. I can sue a school district. I own my own home. You're empowered. I, exactly. And I don't feel like a victim. Okay. I, I, I want to come back. You, you raised an important issue, I thought, about uh, implicit bias. Uh, does that serve a role in terms of attacking these issues when you're talking about disproportionate effects, like the voting rights? Someone did a study and they had um, pictures of people voting. And I think the first picture they had like white people voting. And then the second picture they had black people voting. And they asked if you thought voter ID laws should be in place. The number of people who wanted voter ID laws in place went up after they looked at a photograph that had black people voting. So something's going on in the minds of people that gets threatened by black people exercising the franchise. So, but once again, I'm sure if you ask those people, do you think black people should have the right to vote? They go, of course, of course, and they believe it. But their unconscious is working in a very different way. You also have this notion that there's a lot of voter fraud going on, and you see Fox News pushing this, and apparently there's, voter fraud is negligible. There are most more sightings of UFOs Thank than you. there are incidents Thank of you. recorded voter fraud. But if you asso as associate black people with criminality or laziness or other things, then that, then that fits into a narrative of, oh, they must be being fraudulent at the polls. They must be you know, saying they live one place and live another place and voting in many different places. It ties in with a negative, unconscious view of us that is not borne out by reality. So it's implicit bias, unconscious associations between people who look like us and wrongdoing. I'm curious as to how you take that thought or those measured of implicit bias and insert it into a litigation strategy. How do you present that in a way that a court can measure it and make decisions independent of what the law already says it has to use to measure disproportionate outcomes. Um, and I'm speaking specifically now about the intent. Okay. Because you have to have intent 
as the, you know, mm -hmm. undermining of the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. in order to show that you want to enforce some civil rights. I I'm curious, how do you fit the implicit bias as an attack? How do you use it as a sword to attack mm -hmm. disproportionality in litigation? We do it in a number of ways. We use implicit bias as a marker of intent. And we, we're making those arguments. We're not sure if it's going to win. But what we do in a case is we figure out we can prove intent by other means, by showing the history of the decision and the like. So we feel we can prove intent. Then the medium position is saying we can prove intent, but we also think implicit bias is intentional discrimination. And then the final argument is we think Washington versus Davis should be overturned because the social science around race has changed since 1976. And we now realize that we are not in a society where people are saying nigger. Uh, we're in a society where um, you send out resumes and if a black person's name right. is at the top of the resume, he or she's not gonna get called back. But can you prove that that was motivated by racial animus? So you're doing those three different arguments. I know I've read some of your work where you've talked about jury selection mm -hmm, and the implicit mm -hmm, bias. Mm -hmm. Is it your position that preemptory challenges should not exist or that prosecutors or defense attorneys should not be allowed to use preemptory uh -oh, challenges? DA speaking here. I'm just saying, <laughs> if these, you know, I've used them in the past. I, I'm, you know, I, I want to know your opinion about having that tool marginalized and or removed during a jury process. Here's, here's what I would challenge. Um, in a case, a juror refused to um, indicate his race. And the DA said, that means he's preoccupied with race. Doesn't mean anything at all. I mean, what was going on in this guy's mind? The DA said he walked past one of the potential jurors in the hall. The juror looked at him funny, so he excluded him. What's going on in his mind? You know, is there some view that this black juror was somehow not going to side with the prosecution. So if you are using race to determine how you think the juror is going to rule or what he's going to do, but you haven't really probed into his values and attitudes, to me that kind of translates into an implicit bias thinking that black people are always going to side with the defense which isn't true. When somebody stole my stereo, I was ready for them to have the death penalty. Right, so <laughs> you, you just can't make assumptions about black people or women or Jews and how they may vote on a jury. You've got to really probe. But don't you have bats and challenges that address that or deal with, there are challenges that exist mm -hmm. that deal specifically with race bias decisions mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. terms of jury selection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you feel that they don't go far enough? I do, and I'm not a criminal defense lawyer or prosecutor, so my depth isn't great. But what the um, Washington Supreme Court found, or at least talked about in dicta, was that the exclusion of a black man from a jury was not based on overt hostility towards black people, but was based on some unconscious views that the prosecution, the judge had about what a black juror would do. So that's all we're talking about. We're saying, if you have a good reason to exclude somebody, um, then we're not gonna fight you. But by but excluding somebody because they looked at you funny in the hallway, that, I'm not, I'm not a prosecutor, so maybe that's a ground. It doesn't <laughs> seem like a good grounds for me. And it was a black prosecutor and a black juror, which we found rather interesting. I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts and post Trayvon Martin and post-Ferguson, uh, what do they mean to you in terms of looking at civil rights in this nation? What effect, if any, do you think that they record or reflect about where we are in society? I don't know who it was. It might have been Du Bois. It might have been James Baldwin. But they said black and white people live in two different Americas. And that was really brought out to me after the Trayvon George Zimmerman verdict, and the non-indictment of Darren Wilson. Um, the majority of white people thought that the non-indictment was appropriate. The majority of black people thought it was totally inappropriate. I, my heart just gets broken because what I feel is that we're not 
really seen as full humans, as full Americans. Um, I was getting my nails done the other day and they were playing I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas and I thought, hmm, white, what does it mean to be black? It means that a policeman can shoot an unarmed black kid and there are no consequences. A citizen can shoot an unarmed black kid, there's no consequences. Um, I was coming, I was checking into the Bakersfield airport last week and there were a couple of police cars out in front and I thought, you know, if those one of those policemen shot me, they'd probably, and I feel like I'm going to start crying, there'd probably be no consequence at all because they would come up with some reason why I deserve to be shot. And we can go through all the names of all the unarmed black people mm. who've been shot. And I've heard it said by people on television that black life is cheap, that we're not, our lives aren't seen as, as valuable as those of white people. And like I said earlier, I don't feel like a victim, but I feel like um, we're strangers in a strange land still. But we need to share these stories because I think people don't know that this exists. I tell people, I don't, I drive my car because people won't sit by me on BART. They went, what? What are you talking about? And then I'll talk to some other people. They go, no, they won't. And so people need to know that this goes on. So it's about hearts and minds. One of the brilliant things that Ronald Reagan did is he told stories. And we need to tell our stories to white people so they understand that there are there are councilmen in L.A. who get pulled to the side of the road. My friend um, uh, Ray Marshall lives in Piedmont. He was in his driveway in his house in Piedmont and a police officer made him get out of his car and explain what he was doing there. Crazy. You, you mentioned the uh, death penalty mm -hmm. and you published things in the past related to the death penalty. Can you tell me what your thoughts are about the process well, I'll speak personally. Um, I was engaged to a wonderful man who lived in Jamaica, and um, he was murdered on November 25th, 1997. And I was devastated. Um, and what I'm gonna say now may sound very odd, but one of the things that I thought about after he was murdered is, do I think his murderer should get the death penalty? And I thought, no. I would like to have picked up a gun to shoot him myself. Mm -hmm. I would never do that. But it was very interesting to me because you always hear people saying, well, if you lose someone, you're going to want the death penalty. And I just thought, it's just not right. It's not right. It's not right. So it was um, um, seeing if I really believed what I said I believed. Right. You challenged it. Mm -hmm. And now in the past, you've talked about specifically with the death penalty disproportionality oh my god changing or affecting your thoughts and values about the death penalty uh, do you think that that's an area that can be expanded upon or do you think it's something that could serve as a wedge in the future uh, to change what the death penalty is and how it's applied well here's the thing paul you have people who think that black folks are thugs Rudy Giuliani, well, you're killing each other. Um, you have a, a lot of people who believe that, that, well, we're not racist, but we think black people really do commit a lot of the crimes. So I think the disproportionality argument is not gonna work with those people. What I think is working, I think there are two things that are working. The fact that so many people have been found to be innocent on death penalty, on the death row. Project, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, from Northwestern University. Um, and so you see moratoriums on the death penalty. And then, People talk about how expensive it is to keep people on death row. It's sad that the price, the price is, is something that moves people, but the it does. The economics of racial justice. Exactly. And it, whatever works, as long as it's, you know, is not an unethical argument. But if that works, it works. Um, so and then and then the botched executions, which is just horrifying, yeah. you know. So I think you've Those got. Those are recent, the mm -hmm, recent uh, mm -hmm. cases that have come out, or the mm -hmm. recent ones that have made, brought us to national attention oh, about. Just horrible, horrible. Botched death penalty efforts. But I think the disproportionality argument doesn't work with people. We do a lot of polling and focus group work 
on what moves white people on race, and that doesn't move, disproportionality does not move them. Really? That's interesting. Here's what does move them. Um, if they feel they're getting an unfair advantage, that moves them, which I find very interesting. And we're trying to figure it's out how to work that. the flip side of the coin. That. Yes, yes. If, if we want to see how we can work that into a Prop 209 um, thought, if they feel they're getting more money or benefits because of their race, that makes them feel badly and they're more inclined to support some remedies, which I find very interesting. How have you evolved in terms of your approach to civil rights? Um, I'm probably um, as idealistic as I always have been. I believe in a perfectible world and trying to make things better. I think most people are decent and want to do the right thing. And if you can get the right arguments to them, they'll do the right thing. I think there are many people who have had their fears of black people stoked by um, right-wing people. And that's very sad. I think there are some people who do think you and I are inferior intellectually, morally, um, spiritually. And is it your sense that the younger people or the younger generations are more or less comfortable having conversations about race and understanding discriminatory effects or disproportionality or implicit mm -hmm. biases? I can't generalize, but what I've heard is that they aren't comfortable talking about race because, hey, my friend's black, my girlfriend's Latino, so what's there to talk about? So that's disturbing as well, if, in, if they don't see that there are still markers of um, discrimination. It sounds to me like as, as you're discussing mm -hmm. race and as you address disproportionality, mm -hmm. you use subjects like implicit bias and housing and death penalty to exactly. have those conversations. Exactly. Why not have the open conversation up front? I want to talk about race. How can we discuss race in a way that isn't wedged with these other issues? Is that not possible today in society? My experience is that um, people are very uncomfortable talking about race and will run and flee. I think white people are uncomfortable talking about race because they're afraid that they're going to say something that's offensive, even though they don't mean to be offensive. And so it's, it's easier just to be quiet. I think people of color often are filled with such rage that they feel they can't have a calm conversation about it. What I have You're found... You're going to lift the, the lid off the pot. Can, and, and, um, I find if you lead with implicit bias and talk about empirical studies and the like, it's not threatening. Michelle Alexander kind of led the way on this. When she talked at our conference at Stanford, you could see people's shoulders coming down from around their ears because she wasn't calling anybody a racist dog. She was just saying, we all have these skewed racial views. And people can hear that. And they're not threatened. And you're not going, and you can, and they can sometimes, <laughs> you say, um, you hear them kind of saying a few too many things about mm -hmm. their racial views that are disturbing when you create this safe environment for them. But I think we do talk about the death penalty, suspensions, mass incarceration, health, but you can ease into it in a way that's not threatening. <laughs>